Hello everyone and welcome to season two of The Happiness Journey with Dr. Dan. For this season, we'll be bringing guests who will share their own path to happiness. Now we all have a different definition of happiness. Now for some, it's a huge mansion by the ocean, while others will prefer excellent health and longevity. In this season, my guests will share their journeys on overcoming challenges and managing to keep moving forward despite the odds. Now this show will make you laugh or cry, but most importantly, it will inspire you. Now, the, if they went through tough times and survived, you can too. No matter how hard things may seem, there's always something good coming around the corner. Sometimes, painful things can teach us lessons that we didn't think we needed to know. Now, today, we have a special guest, Jen Koken. Now, Jen had to overcome the loss of her mother, career disappointments, failed relationships, and other hurdles. She is here today to share her story about how she managed to find peace and serenity through these hard times. Now, her journey wasn't easy, and hopefully, her story will give you the tools to overcome your own struggles in life. Jen, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me today. Welcome to The Happiness Journey. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Now, I know that we had a previous conversation before yeah. you uh, came to the studio. Now, in 2011, I know you told me that you went through very difficult times. Do you mind sharing this with us? Not a problem. So um, it's probably the, one of the toughest years of my life. I, my divorce had gone through two years before, but um, I was still upset and angry with my ex-husband. My mother passed away after battling ovarian cancer mm -hmm. uh, for five years. I lost 11 other people that year, uh, cancer, car accident, that kind of thing. Um, and I moved from Colorado back to D.C. for a job that I thought was going to be my dream job and really wound up being one of my worst nightmares and had left my support structure in Colorado. So it was a place where I really felt lost and kind of out of control and just overwhelmed by life. And how did you overcome this overwhelm? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't, I love that your show is called The Happiness Journey because happiness is a journey. And so for me, that whole process was a journey. There was a lot of different things that I tackled. Probably one of the number one things was deal with reality. Hmm. Deal with what's happening in front of me. Did my ex-husband walk out? Yes, that's what happened. We got a divorce. He left, that's what happened. Anything else that I was suffering over or adding to it was all the meaning about myself and what did I do wrong and wasn't I a good wife and wasn't I a good stepmom and you know those times in our lives we start replaying every single mistake we made and it's times 10. Mm -hmm. So I had to really separate myself from the thoughts I was having and the feelings I had about things and just stick with the facts. Did 12 people in my life die that year? Absolutely. Did my mom die of uh, ovarian cancer? Yes. But I always had the ability to choose how I was going to respond to the situation. And for me, that's how I define responsibility, your ability to respond to upsets, to failures. And so all of it, my job was to find the silver lining. My job was to understand what was this to teach me. And I had great coaches around me that helped guide me along that process. Now, it is human nature that everyone mentions that, oh, I was a victim of circumstances. Yep. How, and I know that you said in your previous, in our previous conversation that you're not a victim of circumstances. So how do you put yourself in a situation where um, you're not? That why life has attacked you this way? Right. I think one thing to remember is life happens. <laughs> Good stuff's going to happen. Bad stuff's going to happen. And I often coach people and they say to me, well, I just want life to feel balanced because there's too many highs and too many lows. And I try to remind them, if life is balanced like this, boop, that also means you're flatlining and you're no longer alive. Life's That's about right. those ups and downs. Mm -hmm. So understand, things will happen to you, but again, how are you gonna respond to the situation? You may get mad for a moment, but if you stay mad for a lifetime, that to you, keeping that anger inside you and keeping that stress inside you and you're you're not able to make the difference you're here to make so i think the key to all of this is understanding things happen that's the circumstances we always have a way to respond to those can i forgive my ex-husband for walking out absolutely do i agree with what he did do i absolve him of everything forgiveness is not agreeing with somebody or acquiescing or rolling over mm -hmm. Forgiveness is giving up your right to resent 
that that happened to you. So when you're a victim, you resent what's happening. It's like sure. you're thinking life is personally out to get you. If you can let go of that resentment and start asking questions like, what am I, what can I learn from this? Or why me, why not me? So how come this has been put in front of me? What can I learn? How can I grow from this? And that's the way to stop being a victim. Interesting, this is actually a good technique. Yeah. Have you practiced mindfulness during your whole journey to uh, what you've gone through, losing your mom and losing 11 other friends or family members or going through divorce? Have you lived in the moment and not really recourse to the past to be able to feel guilty of what happened to you specifically? When I have. I mean, that's like the short answer, right? Yes. It's really easy to live in the moment when you're mindful of living in the moment. And of course, as human beings, things happen. We get triggered. We get angry. We get upset. Uh, a, a song comes on and it reminds me of my mom or, you know, December 23rd is her birthday. Oh, yeah. So every year I would go home to see her. My parents split when I was very young. Thanksgiving was with my dad and my stepmom. Christmas was with my mom and my stepdad because mm -hmm. we would, that would be our time together, celebrate her birthday, celebrate the holidays. And so every year it's gotten a little bit easier. And this year for the first time I created a new um, a new thing that I was going to do every year, which was to go visit my friends and their kids and stay with them down in Southern Maryland. And I realized, oh, this is the first year I didn't really miss her because I had okay. a new type of thing that I was having in my a life, you know, a new habit, as it were, where I could surround myself with love and remind myself that I was loved the way any mom would remind their child. Interesting. <coughs> now, I know anyone who would gone through what you went through, losing so many like family members, accident, cancer, your mom, your divorce, they would go into a severe depression, but yet you managed to write a book. Yes, I did. If yeah. you could just tell us about, the first, the title is really interesting, which <laughs> is, When I Die, Take My Panties. Yeah. What, do, how did you come up with that title, first of all? My mom came up with that title. Okay. And it was something she said to me. So um, she's a good Jewish mother, you mm -hmm. know, and a month before she died, I went to visit her down in Florida, and she was, it was a little surreal because so she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, it's a difficult disease to diagnose. She was misdiagnosed for a year because the symptoms are quite silent. I see. So when she was diagnosed, because the symptoms are silent, most women are diagnosed with less than a five, 18% uh, chance of living five years. Oh, wow. So we knew we had her five years, maybe, and she lived five years, one month, and eight days. Right? She was, a, she used to call her the Energizer Bunny. She's a <laughs> phenomenal woman. So the month before she died, um, she pulled me aside into her room and started showing me different things she wanted me to have. You know, here's this necklace that your grandfather gave me that I want you to have. Here's a fur coat your grandfather, your other grandfather made that I want you to have. She pulls open this drawer and she goes, these panties, they're very expensive. <laughs> Goodwill won't take them. You shouldn't throw them away. Take my panties. Okay. It's like, okay, mom, I'll do <laughs> it's it. A promise. I'll, yes. It's a promise. I'll do it, right? So that's where it came from. But for me, it became a metaphor for how to live life. You know, how do you live life so that you're giving everything? We have this lifetime. We have this consciousness. We have this moment. If we are a victim of our circumstances, we can't contribute the way we're here to contribute, whatever way that is for each of us. We have this lifetime. And what if we lived it to such a degree that at the end, you're like, I don't care. Take my draws. Take... <laughs> whatever you want because I have given it all and that was what I was here to do. So the book was written really as an homage to my mom um, after she passed away and as a way for me to make sure that what happened to her doesn't happen to other women because mm -hmm. I made her a promise that her death would make a difference. So I educate women about ovarian cancer, I speak about it and I'm happy to say that there's at least two women I know that have been diagnosed early after speaking with me and hearing me talk and went into their doctor and they had either precancer cells oh, in the fallopian okay. tubes or stage one ovarian cancer. And that's a really rare thing to diagnose it that early. Is so. there, what, what are the chances to be able to be cured if you're in stage one? Stage one is really high because okay. it, at that point it hasn't metastasized to any other place in your body. Okay. And so if they remove, uh, they now are finding that ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tube. So if they can remove the fallopian tubes, remove the ovary, sometimes a total hysterectomy, but it's really likely that you'll recover without a problem. Okay. When you're di And there's many women that have been diagnosed at a later stage that are still alive today, but the majority of women don't survive. Oh, wow. It's one of the highest mortality rates of any of the reproductive cancers for women. As bad as prostate cancer? 
Uh, I don't know what the stats are for prostate okay. cancer. Yeah. Interesting. But even that of being able to talk about it so freely and, and, and working with my mom through her death and being with her and making sure that her death was a contribution mm -hmm. is another part of my journey of managing my grief and being able to move through it in a way that I was able to be in the present because every time I talk about her, she's right here with me. Interesting. Yeah. Now that's just, I know that you're a coach, right? You're a life yes, coach. Yep. And your company is called Embrace the Ridiculousness of Life. Yes. How did you come up with that uh, company name? Because life's ridiculous. Look at all mm -hmm. the things that happened to me in 2011. Mm -hmm. That's a good you example, know, yeah. I mean, how many times do you say to yourself, I'm leading a good life and X happens or Y happens or you thought everything was going along great and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, Rah! it's life. If we can embrace the absurdity, the highs and the lows, we get our sense of humor back, we get our heart back, we get our passion back, and that makes a difference. Interesting. Now, I know that you, with all the things that you've gone through, the difficulties and so on and so forth, um, you still have a smile on your face. You yeah. still have the love to be able to help others. How do you keep on going with this positivity despite everything that you've uh, dealt with? I wouldn't want to live any other way because if I couldn't find the good and what was happening around me, I would be less than what I'm here to do in this lifetime. And for me, my commitment is creating a world of people at home with themselves, where people feel comfortable in their own skin. Because when you feel comfortable in your own skin, you're free to love, you're free to connect. Um, so it's, it hasn't always been easy. It's been me mastering it throughout my lifetime. And I'm always at practice. Some days are better than others. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And during those good days or bad days, what do you do as your daily routine to be able to keep on going moving forward? I mean, I know, like you said, there's ups and downs, yeah. you know, frustration, stress, et cetera. Yeah. What are your techniques? What do you do? I, m I meditate every morning for okay. at least 20 minutes. Um, I, at night, go back through my day and write, and r either write down or think about five to 10 things I'm grateful for. I often will write down what I've accomplished that day because I think so often our brains focus on the lack what's bad, what's wrong, what we didn't do. We don't always take the time to reflect and celebrate what we've accomplished. So that's really important too. And then during the day, I have little reminders that pop up on my phone to remind me to be joyful, to remind me to appreciate the deliciousness of life, to remind me to go easy. And so those little reminders help me. And then I have got great coaches that I still have around me who I call when I'm in the thick of things because I know by myself, I can't always find that silver lining. Hmm, interesting. And do you like your meditation is based more on positive affirmation coming in? And uh, what are your method of meditation? Um, so I, I kind of, it's a hybrid of two different um, ways that I've studied. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I'm imagining white light coming down through my crown chakra and I'm breathing it in and breathing it up. So it's a continuous loop. And then I just stay there for 20 to 30 minutes until I can feel my body ease. And it's almost like I disappear and I become one with the white light. Wow, okay. And do you like, do you do this seven days a week, like same time in the morning, like when you wake up? I do it when I wake up before I get out of bed. That is the best time to do it, because if I don't, it doesn't happen. There's days I miss, but if I, that's, that's my um, technique, is to wake up, prop myself up, get into my pose, and then do the meditation. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we will take a quick break. Now stay tuned to hear more from our guest, Jen Koken. Message from the universe. Love everything you already have. I'd say the biggest decision of your life was not your career, your marital status, or your home. It was choosing to love as often as you have. Your lover, the universe. If you know what you're worth, then go out there and get it. Don't expect anyone to give you anything. If you truly want it, you will do everything you can to get it. Don't settle for less. You are worth a lot more. With the right attitude in life, you can accomplish anything you put your mind into. I'm aware that some may have better opportunities than others, or have better education, or a better life without much struggles. However, not having all those enables you to be more creative and do the best thing with what you already have. Don't fret with what you don't have, as of yet, but focus on your strength and avoid comparing your weaknesses with someone else's strength. It will always be a lost battle for you. So what should you do? It all depends on how much you want it. If you fail, avoid pointing fingers to him or her or anybody else for your failures. You are the one responsible for your own actions. You make choices, assume responsibilities. 
Cowards do the opposite. Try not to be one. Now, to learn more about the universe, be sure to catch my show, The Happiness Journey, right here on MCM. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Dan, and I'm here with Jen Koken. Now, we're discussing her own way to finding happiness in life. Jen, thank you again for being here today. I'm so glad I'm here. Now, we, before we went to the break, we are talking about your book. Yeah. Now, like I said, many were going through a severe depression, anxiety attack, and so on and so forth. You managed to write a book. Now, is it an autobiography about your experience with what your mom went through and what you went through after her death? Can you explain or just elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, it, 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 it jumps around a bit. So when the book starts, it's the day that I found out about my mom's uh, ovarian cancer. And then it goes back through some of the setbacks I had had in my life that I didn't realize were preparing me for that five-year journey with mm -hmm. her, that were preparing me and making me stronger in my view of life and my, my view of who I was and, and what I was capable of being with somebody who I love, who had a death sentence, who I knew was going to pass away, no matter what we talked about, you know? So it's recalling some of those stories, and then much of it is the what I went through with her. But the funny part, people say, oh, is it, it must be really depressing reading the book, but most people have laughed out loud while they're reading it, because I'm also a comedian, mm. so I <laughs> use my humor. It helps. <laughs> yeah, it helps, and I use my humor throughout the book. And there's so much that I learned, and what I really tried to do was to share with people, here's what I learned about this lesson. You know, for example, day after my mother died, I was sitting there, I had to go buy something black. I didn't want to bring anything with me, even though I knew I was going to be with her in hospice because I didn't want to jinx anything, you know? And I'm driving my car there, and you know, my ex and I had been apart for two years. We really weren't talking. He was reaching out to me and saying, I want to help. And I had to say to him, I don't want to be vulnerable with you. I don't want to talk with you. You know, you're the one who said, I don't want to be with you. Why would I want to talk with a guy who, re who rejected me, right? Mm -hmm. And I had this epiphany, Dan. I had this epiphany where I realized, holy moly, here's what was really going on in that marriage. I never let him love me the way I wanted to, the way he wanted to, rather. You know, because I had thought about my mom and my stepdad and my dad. I love my dads. Love them. They're both curmudgeon mm -hmm. kind of gruff on the outside, but the mm -hmm. heart of gold. And I thought, well, I want a guy who's, you know, who's going to be loving toward me and going to show me that. And it struck me that my ex was just like that. He was always very loving. I just didn't recognize his, his, uh, his way of expressing that. His love language. Way, love language, exactly. That's the word I was looking <laughs> for. I didn't, I didn't recognize his love language. So when I got home, I pulled in the driveway and called him and shared this with him and said, I, I don't know how it was being married to me, but it must have been really hard for you because you're such a caring person. It must have been really hard for you to feel rejected by me. And there was this dead silence. And he said, you have no idea what a pain in the butt you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it was the beginning of a friendship. And so I can say now we're best friends. He's somebody I would call if I needed anything. I'm in my stepkids' lives. That's something that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't continued to reflect on my life. And so in the book, I'm very authentic, I'm very raw, I'm very vulnerable, I'm very genuine, because I want other people to learn from what I went through. It doesn't mean I'm going to prevent someone from making the same mistake, mm -hmm. but maybe in that moment they can remind themselves, wait a minute, I read a book by that woman, Jen Koken, and she took the time to reflect on herself instead of pointing the finger out there. Let me take a moment to do that. Interesting. So would you say that the main issue in your relationship with your ex-husband was communication? Yeah, I would say it was communication. And it was, it was not dealing with reality also. It was both of us seeing the person we wanted to see versus the person in front of us seeing the marriage we wanted to see versus what was happening in front of us. This is why I keep coming back to whether you're dealing with a marriage, whether you're dealing with your life, whether you're dealing with a cancer patient, you got to deal with reality. And that was one of the ways my mom and I were so able. That's why she lived as long as she did, because we, I kept working with her. We worked together to visualize what a healthy life was. But we always dealt with reality. And we always made sure we said everything. It's so my second rule, say everything. I didn't always say everything to my ex-husband. He didn't always say everything to me. And when you start stepping over things, it's like a dog who the owner never cleans, after that, cleans up mm -hmm. after them in the backyard. All of a sudden, there's no more room to run around because there's poop <laughs> all over the backyard. That's a good analogy. <laughs> Same yeah. thing in the relationship. <laughs> you don't clean up that stuff, you have less and less room to communicate. That's really, really true. And uh, the, the fact that you, um, when you did write this book, 
And I know that you also mentioned that you had a political career. I did. Were you doing this in, you know, like at the same time, or I was going through my mom's death at okay. the same time. So I was um, involved with very involved with politics out in Colorado. I ran for office. I was chair of one of the parties. I'm not going to say which. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I had been a grassroots organizer for years. In fact, after President Obama was elected, my dad called me and said, oh, I finally understand what you do for a living. You're a grassroots organizer, like the president. Mm -hmm. I'm like, thank God, he finally <laughs> gets, gets it, it you know? Um, so during the time that I wrote the book, I actually was in between jobs. You know, I had been laid off from the job that I thought was gonna be wonderful. Um, laid off, resigned, did, was not working out, so I left and then took the time to grieve because that was part of the issue why that job wasn't working out. I hadn't taken any time to grieve. I just mm. boom went on to the next thing. And that's one of the key lessons in life. If something happens to you, you've got to take the time. I don't care if it's a loss of a marriage, the loss of a job, the loss of um, a friend, the loss of a, a, a dream that you had because you failed a business. You've mm -hmm. got to take the time to grieve, reflect, celebrate your accomplishments, then you'll have space to move on. But don't people like take too long to grieve and during that grievance, they add so much more negativity in their life and this is the reason why they cannot move on. There's a certain meaning or a certain path that you have to take when you do grieve. Like in your case, you try to find a positive behind all that. You try to learn about, okay, what was the lesson and how can I make myself better? Others, because they grieve too long, they feel that because of one failure, they cannot do anything else. They, they're just stuck. How do you overcome being stuck at that point? I mean, when you do grieve, which is really important, as you mentioned, but what do you do to be able to uh, get moving forward after that grievance? It's a good question. I don't think you can put a timeline on grievance because there's that book on grief and grieving that goes through the stages of grief. And I think all too often people get caught up in there's a stage, there's a formula, there's a way that I'm supposed to go. No, it's a holographic. Grief is holographic. One day you're angry, one day you're depressed, mm. one day you're happy and giggling at the weirdest thing and you don't know why. I think what you, what you keyed in on here though, Dan, is important, which is you could be staying stuck by holding on to being upset, by holding on to I failed, by holding on to I didn't do something I should have. You know, there's an analogy about how trappers trap monkeys in the jungle. Mm -hmm. So they have these traps with a hole, and the hole is big enough for either a banana or the monkey's arm, but not both. They put a banana in the trap. The monkey comes along, reaches for the banana, can't get the banana out. Why? Because the hole won't do both, but they won't let go of the banana. Mm -hmm. And the trappers come along and scoop them up. In life, many times human beings are like that. We're holding on to our bananas. <laughs> and we're the ones who are suffering. So you want to figure out what are the bananas I'm holding on to so I can stop suffering over whatever's happened to me. That's when you stop grieving and can finally create something new and move on. Wow, you narrowed it down pretty well. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Now, have you had recourse to friends and family when you were going through this grievance? And I know that your personality would say that, you know, I do not want to be a burden to anyone. So have you reached out to others to be able to help you go through the loss of your mom or loss of your job or the relationship failure? Have you reached out to others? Absolutely, you have to, and I think generally we don't want to because we don't want to burden somebody. Mm -hmm. We don't want to bring someone else down. Well, I'm upset. I don't want to bring anybody else down. Those are the times I make sure I pick up the phone. I had people on speed dial at certain points in my life where, you know, it was like, what do I do now? It's beautiful outside. Go out and take a walk and call me back kind of thing. When you reach out to people, it actually helps them help you because it creates a change in their brain chemistry where they're feeling special, they're feeling happy because they can help you. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're in a funk, what you should do is reach out and help somebody, do something for somebody else, practice kindness. You'll get out of your funk in an instant. Wow, so during how long really did it take you, personally speaking, to go through all those difficult times? I mean, have you, has it taken you like two years to grieve, three years, four years? How long did you feel like, okay, I'm back to normal and I could do things without relying on anyone? I don't, think, I don't think normal is never relying on anybody. Okay. I don't see it as a weakness to rely on people. I see it as a strength because you're building community around you. Mm -hmm. You're finding people who all we want to do is be connected. You know, I've been in rooms of people where I've said, how many of you love contributing and connecting to people? Everyone raises their hand. How many of you love when people 
you know, when asking for help. Nobody raises their hand. And I said, okay, what we have is a world of people who want to help each other and nobody asking. So I think it's abnormal when we don't ask for help. And maybe it took me a year before I felt quote unquote normal. But each time there might have been new things that came up. You know, as a life coach, I say that people are like artichokes. There's a heart in the middle. Mm -hmm. And we have layers we have to peel away. And sometimes the prickliest part is the part right in the middle before you get to that yes. heart. And that's the hardest piece. If we keep going, what's left is our heart and our passion. Wow. That's the artichoke uh, metaphor is interesting. <laughs> Artichokes, bananas, <Yeah. laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Now, to conclude, what would be any words of wisdom that you'd like to share to our viewers about your own personal difficulties? I think the key thing is you'll survive. You'll survive. You know, life has probably handed you bad stuff before you got through it. You'll get through it this time. You're not a victim. Look for that silver lining. And if you can't find it, ask someone else to help you. Wow. That actually is a very, very good words of wisdom. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Jen, for coming and uh, you know sharing all your views or all your personal you know, experience to our viewers. Now, we hope you have all enjoyed today's episode. And I'm very excited about season two of The Happiness Journey full of inspirational stories. Here are a few concluding words of wisdom. Now, if you were able to look back in 2016 at your most brilliant successes, stunning comebacks, amazing catches, and smoking ideas, and you were to find that virtually all of them seemed to be materializing out of thin air when you least expected them, and they had exceeded even your greatest expectation at the time, how excited would you be about coming into the new year and what are you about to accomplish? I'm sure you're getting chills and they're multiplying. Now, my name is Dr. Dan Amzalag and have yourself a wonderful day.